Hello and welcome to all the students who are joining us. My name is Alyssa Young and I am the director of the Original Americas. Thank you so much for joining us for the 2021 Virtual Student Fellowship. We will be taking you behind the scenes of firms that believe in authenticity, in design and architecture. An added highlight for this year's fellowship is that students who attend five or more sessions will have the chance to win a portfolio or resume review by one of the presenters. This valuable feedback and career advice is sure to help you form your career. Some quick housekeeping, there will be Q&A following the presentation today. You can find that Q&A button at the top or bottom of your screen. Please be sure to send in your questions as you think of them. There's no need to wait until the end. We will get through as many questions as possible as time permits. Now, one of the most iconic chairs in the world is the Emico Navy Chair. Today, you'll be going virtually inside the Emico factory in Hanover, Pennsylvania, where you will see and hear about the process of creating this famous chair. You will hear directly from Greg Buckbinder, owner and CEO, along with Jay Buckbinder and Nicole Rundy, who head up product development as they discuss the intricacies of working with the world's top industrial designers, maintaining Emico's sustainability ethos, and continuing to hone the legacy of American manufacturing 77 years in the making. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Greg, Jay, and Nicole. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're, we're really excited to be here. Yeah, this is great. Um, last year we did the, the virtual uh, presentation and it worked out so well that we're, we're excited to do it again. Yeah, and I think last year, you know, Greg and I had a conversation and one thing that had come up was in prior years, we were able to show the students around the factory. And so now this year, Nicole, um, who we will be introducing to is going to narrate some factory clips she took so you guys can actually get a little bit more insight into what goes on at the factory. Um, for us, it's a huge part of working in product development, being there and working hands on with the materials. So it'll be exciting to show you that and give you kind of a taste of what it's actually like to work at a furniture company and also, you know, some of the legacy of Emico and get to pick Greg's brain about Emico too. Are you ready, Greg? I'm set. Okay. So, you know, the first thing I think that's important to talk about is who you are and your own ethos to kind of level set what Emico is. So yes. tell us a little bit more about the, where you come from and why that's important. Well, I have, I grew up with a couple parents that were very design orientated and I surfed a lot. So I spent a lot of time in the ocean and it made me very environmentally aware and concerned. So from there, it was, you know, everything I have done and everything in Emico, uh, we focus on how can we have the least impact on the environment? Yeah. And I think, you know, um, Greg still picks me up every week and this week it was yesterday at 5.30 in the morning to go surf. And when you see, when you're in the ocean and immersed like that, you start to think about uh, what we're putting into the world and taking care of the planet so we can continue to do the things we love. Yeah, it's especially interesting because you always see seabirds and you see dolphins and, and you know when there's plastics or toxins or anything that go in the ocean, it's, it's just gotta be so harmful. And ultimately it goes up the food chain and it, it becomes harmful for people. Yeah. And you know, the everyday example of LA is one thing. I think this photo is um, you know, in, in Alaska surfing on a glacier in Alaska and that glacier used to extend a mile forward. So not to you know, be, uh, a doomsday about the environment, but we're seeing these effects take, have bigger and bigger impact. And I think that it pushes Emico. Well, you know, and, and this is also interesting because this happened in a, in a short period of time, like five years yeah. and climate change is really accelerating. So it's, it's really important for all of us to be cognizant about what we can do to make sure we have, uh, 
we have less impact. Yeah. I think for us, this is just to show you guys as students, you know, yes, we're a furniture company. We make chairs and tables and some benches, but realistically we're environmentalists. And I think when you think about your career, picking out what matters to you and what you want to prioritize for us, it's, you know, doing, doing the least harm in making something and hopefully also inspiring young designers and other companies to follow suit. You know, it's interesting because when you have a strong purpose and everybody on your team believes in what you're doing, it's super easy to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, when you're, whatever you're working on, whatever you're doing, really focus on that purpose and make sure everybody is in alignment. Yeah. You, you know, Greg actually called me this morning at 540 in the morning to tell me he wanted to make sure that came across. So I just, you know, want to double down on that point that it's finding your values and making choices aligned with your values. Um, okay. But we can, we can milk crate all day. So we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about Emico. So Greg, tell us about the history of Emico. So Emico goes back to world war two and the Navy had a problem. They needed chairs that would survive on Navy ships and submarines. They needed something that was, you know, held up to the salt air. They needed something that was fireproof. You know, fire on a ship is, is lethal. They needed something that was non-magnetic, wouldn't, wouldn't hurt the instruments. They needed something that the big burly sailors wouldn't destroy when they were out at sea. And Emico developed this extraordinary chair and the material they selected that was the best material for this purpose was aluminum. And then they had a, a real elaborate process, we call it 77 step process, that takes the chair through st so many steps. If you come to Emico at some time, you'll see all these workshops with inside the factory from cutting, bending, forming, welding, grinding, annealing, heat treating, um, hand finishing, anodizing, and that's what makes a chair so extraordinary. And that guided with craftsmen who do this extraordinary work, that's, that's why the, the chairs are, are end up like they are. Yeah. And one thing to even point out there is one reason it was the best material is because wartime, there weren't that many materials available and they chose recycled aluminum. So it started in 1944 using a recycled material. You know, and that just talks back to the values. It wasn't environmentalism at that point. It was availability, but you yeah. know, these things are starting to get ingrained. Right, and, and, and during the war, there was a shortage of aluminum and they had scrap drives in order to get the aluminum to make the chairs. Mm -hmm. And that's where kind of the whole idea of recycling began. Yeah. So next, you know, normally what we would do is show you parts of the 77 steps in chronological order. What we wanna do is actually talk about pieces that aren't necessarily in order, starting with um, heat treat, because it's, it's such a huge part of what makes Emico special and makes it a hard chair to knock off because you have um, just strength that you're not getting other places. And we wanted to introduce Nicole, who works with me on uh, product development, who's like our resident expert on the Emico steps. So she's gonna walk you guys through this uh, next film. So, you know, as, as you guys mentioned, um, the soft aluminum that we're able to use that was available during the wartime that was, you know, the reason why we're able to use aluminum was because we have this special heat treating process that we do at the factory. So you can see here, Adam is dunking the 1006 Navy chairs into a 960 degree salt bath. So it's super hot. And this is the first step in our entire hardening process, which will make the chairs torpedo proof, you know, which was the original requirement from the Navy in the 40s. Um, and the salt bath, after the salt bath, um, the chairs come out and get quenched in cool water before they get baked in an oven overnight. So all of these processes, these special processes that have been developed are um, all combined together to make the aluminum like three times stronger than steel. So taking this scrap material and really making it into something super strong using this process that we have um, is really kind of the, 
the, the cornerstone of why the chairs last so long and why we can guarantee them for life. Oops. Yeah, exactly. And I think it, it it's it's not the first step, but it's a super important one. And it's also a fan favorite, you know, like watching that aluminum chair get dunked in and light up in flames is it never gets old. Well, and it's important to know also there's a science behind what we make. It's about, you know, arranging the molecules so we get the maximum strength from them, arranging them in, in, in ways where we can get smooth bends. And it's, it's not like any other chair is made in the world. Yeah, and the other part of it is focusing on how do we use this recycled material and make it the strongest possible, not just start off and mill a block of steel to make a strong chair. You know, like take this thing that this waste stream and make it strong via process. And there's right. kind of two parts to that too. There's, you know, like the, the process itself and the people working on it. Right, you know, it, it is interesting because you might assume that all aluminum chairs are great and that's not the case. Um, you can do really crappy chairs with aluminum but you really need to make a great chair. You need to use good processes. You need good craftsmanship. You need the right alloy of aluminum. There's a lot of real intricacies to making something great. Yeah, and a huge part of that craftsmanship at Emico is actually the welding. Um, and the welding, it's just the most incredible thing. And Nicole will narrate it, but it's like these craftsmen have been working there since 1944. I mean, not, not the same guys, but they make these beautiful welds and it's you know, like, I, I took welding and absolutely failed. I know how difficult it is. And it's so critical to making something beautiful. That's also super strong. So we have, we have a, a video of that too with uh, Joaquin here. Yeah, the welding is really one of the big, another big strength point for the chairs. Um, as Jay mentioned, this is Joaquin, he's worked at a weld as a welder at Emico for over 16 years. And he's just like so many of the guys, so attentive to detail. Um, here you can see him using a fixture to clamp on everything and um, weld on arms to a 1006 Navy chair. So he uses the fixture, he clamps everything in place super carefully for a perfect fit. And then he uses small tack welds in each position to kind of um, temporarily hold the parts in position before he can do full welds around every joint and every chair foot rest seat on every chair gets the same super detailed treatment to the welds that really help make um, each joint smooth and strong and um, it's definitely not the fastest way to <laughs> put together a chair but it makes it so so strong. Mm -hmm. And I think actually, you know, the, the welding was one of the things that differentiated Emico from other furniture companies and the, the craftsmen there. And uh, Greg, maybe it'd be good to talk about, you know, like the first big collaboration and how that came about. Yeah, you know, this, this is a project that um, we did with Philippe Stark. I met him at a trade show and he said he always dreamed of doing an Emico chair. And I was a little concerned because, you know, our Navy chair is, is the heart and soul of the company and didn't really want anybody that would mess with that and do anything. He said, no, what he wanted to do is wash it, even make it more neutral. So I think that's a really important point from a design standpoint, not trying to do more, but actually taking what our strengths were mm -hmm. and, and really distilling it down. So this is a photograph of, of me with one of the guys polishing. We didn't polish before uh, Stark came. He wanted to have a shiny surface and we actually have some neighbors at Harley Davidson and I brought a chair over and they were gracious enough to help us learn how to polish. Now we have a whole polishing department, but it's interesting because we, we did a thousand chairs for the Hudson Hotel over 20 years ago. And those thousand chairs, they're still in use. So one of the things that we really aim for is how can we make a chair with the longest possible life with, with really a lot of use? Yeah, and I think the other thing is how do we work with people who are attracted to our values and materials and our know-how? You know, like Stark came 
to Emiko because he knew of this legacy of durability and using recycled aluminum and making these great chairs and then pushed it a little further. So everything we're doing, we're learning from and also just like building up a, a, a bigger knowledge base of the materials we work with. So that's an important point. One of the things as a manufacturer, we always look for is a designer that brings us new knowledge. They teach us things. They teach us things we didn't know before and they push us. So like Stark said to me, he said, if it's difficult, do it. If it's impossible, I'll change the design. That really is, is important for a manufacturer in, in the sense it really pushed us to, to learn how to do things we didn't know how to do before. Mm -hmm. And I think that's especially true with the polishing, which has just become so ingrained in the Emico ethos and didn't exist before that. And we have um, a, a video of that right here. Yeah, polishing is definitely one of the most special things that we do. Um, and it's such a unique process that you don't see other places really in the same way. Um, here you can see Polly. Um, he applies an abrasive compound to the buffing wheel, which is made out of like a soft felt. Um, so the abrasive compound helps him kind of grind at the surface, but the, the brushing wheel is soft. So it produces this mirror finish over time. And it really requires his skilled hand, you know, to just push just enough to buff it. And um, the pressure needs to be just right. So you can kind of see this as he's brushing, you can see the reflection of the wheel in the chair, like he is putting a mirror finish on. Um, each chair is polished three times. Like he spends many, many hours. Um, it really is a labor of love. And by the time he's done, it's like a little, you know, it's like a mirrored surface. It's like a little jewel. It's very, um, it's amazing. Yeah. So what, what's really interesting about it is we're not adding any layers. We're not adding uh, any kind of, anything. This is the actual material itself. So, you know, like we have chairs in our home. I have the first 10 chairs and they were, were down at the beach and I was hoping they would oxidize and patina over time. So the seats would be shiny and the backs would be dull. And maybe they've done that a little bit, but not much. Mm -hmm. But if I want to, all the little tiny scratches over the years, I can actually buff those out and make it look like just brand new. So there's that surface, that material is just amazing material. Yeah. And again, it comes down to durability, you know, like you're not putting on some kind of coating that's going to rub off over time. You're doing something that can either be fixed if you want it to, or looks good with use. Um, and I think, you know, the, um, the opening up of different processes and designs, starting with Stark kind of led to other collaborations. Well, at this point after Stark, I mean, we went from this industrial uh, government contractor to a design furniture company. And, you know, but Frank Gehry did know us. He did specify us for, for a project and um, he wanted to do a chair. Again, what he brought us is a whole different kind of mindset. He wanted to do a chair that would be flexible, that would move like airplane wings, they flex or tall buildings, they move. And he wanted to do a chair. So when you sat in the chair, it would flex with your body to add comfort. Mm -hmm. And it came back to material too. You know, Stark was, how do we make this industrial material a, a piece of jewelry? And with Frank, it was, how do we make this thin and strong? You know, like he's coming from the architectural point of view. How do we make this a structure? And, right. you know, each person, like you were saying before, is bringing something to us that we didn't learn we didn't know I mean, I mean we never knew about how do you make aluminum flex that i mean none of the guys in the shop ever thought about making a chair that way that's kind of counter thinking yeah and it was just a great opportunity to just learn how this material works in a whole new way yeah and i think with each collaboration that you've worked on we've worked on it's it's done that you know it pushes you one direction and the other and we could talk honestly, probably for hours about each one. Um, but you know, the, it, I think the important thing for a young designer is again, each, each project you take on, there are learnings that come from that, that you can then apply to a future project, even if you don't use them immediately. And also there isn't one standard process that all the designers use. 
how they approach a project. Um, you know, Philippe Stark is very pragmatic. He knows we're going to do this and this and this, and he's, he's measuring things. He knows precisely what he wants to do. Frank Gehry is, is scribbling on paper, and he's just wanting to do something that nobody's ever done before. Mm -hmm. So it's a different path, but they both end up with very unique uh, specific products that, that they want to do. Yeah. And for Nicole and I, probably one of the most fun things is learning how the designers operate. You know, some designers want to drop off the design and then you give them a little feedback. You hear back from them a month later with some results, you know, and some every day want, want to know, want to see the prototype, you know, like want to touch the, the materials. And it's, it's really interesting. I think there's no one right way, but it's fun to the, the working with other people and these creative minds is really interesting. Um, and recently we actually launched, I have it here and it was in the beginning, of it, the Zostwell with Nanto Fukasawa. And um, this was an interesting project because once again, and it was working with aluminum, but his whole idea was not about jewelry or flex. It was about how do we make something that looks like it's existed forever. Now, so this looks like it could have been part of Emiko's collection from, you know, starting from the forties. And he, it looks very simple, but we actually started talking back in 2006. We began working on the project in 2015, and we just launched it this year. Sometimes it, take, it takes a lot of time to really get everything right and to get the details right. And when you sit on a stool like that, it's amazing the difference between sitting on that. I, can, I sit on a stool all day, and that stool, the Zaw stool, because of the way it's shaped, it's very comfortable. It has smooth edges and it's got a little place to index your butt and it's a, it's a really great stool. And it's a kind of product that it can be used anywhere, indoor, outdoor, uh, any kind of application. So it's, it's something that will last several lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And for us, this goes back to process. You know, one thing we had aced is brushing. We are like bread and butter is being able to brush the aluminum and you know grind the welds down and brush them this is a weld here and all of a sudden it's super flat to get achieve this angle um and then we learned how to radially brush so we could get this cd style brushing at the top that he wanted so you know going back to like the process using our 77 steps to be able to achieve these designs and we we have a brushing video to show you too yeah, each chair takes so many meters and meters of weld, you know, like we showed with Joaquin going around each joint with welding means that for us, we want to grind all those welds smooth, perfectly smooth, so that the chair has this seamless look to it where you can't tell where one piece of aluminum ends and another begins. And that is what happens here in grinding and brushing where they take handheld abrasion tools and they go over every surface carefully to remove any welds or bumps or imperfections to create this like uniform chair. Um, here, um, Zach's working on our one inch all aluminum frame where we, we, it's completely entirely aluminum seamlessly welded together and then brushed to create this perfect surface. Yeah, so it's, it's a pretty incredible thing to go from the knobby welds down to these really seamless lines. Um, and, you know, I think the, the this idea of how we made this chair and achieving the aesthetics started to translate over from aluminum to other materials with a pretty significant collaboration. Well, actually, we, we were approached by Coca-Cola and they had gone to the Museum of Modern Art and were looking for a company that had a very environmental position and could help solve a problem that they had. And um, they shared with uh, Coca-Cola our name and they said, you know, Emico is really very focused on that and they solve problems for the Navy. I'm sure they can help solve your problems. And their problems were these waste plastic bottles and landfills in the ocean. And it was, again, an opportunity for us to try to figure out how can we upcycle this material and make it into a strong chair with a long life. And it was a, it was a big challenge and it took us uh, four years to develop the material uh, in a way that it was able, we were able to achieve that. 
Yeah, and I think there were a few things that came out of that beyond just the collaboration. One being really opened our eyes to saying, okay, we've, we're the masters of aluminum. Now let's see, are there other waste streams that we can work with? And potentially, you know, like looking at the industry, are there reasons why we can't use waste material? And figuring out how to work on it and then continue to iterate with it, um, I, I think is a, an important uh, like value, you know, like the idea that we have a developing mentality, not just like fixed on we're, we're done with this now. Right, and I, I think that same purpose applies. It's like, how can we take a waste material and make it into something that that is useful, that is going to last a long time, and we apply it to a different material. Mm -hmm. um, this is our one-inch reclaimed chair, and here's Nicole examining it thoroughly <laughs> at the um, working right when it's coming out of the press, injection molded, and um, you know. This is a recycled polypropylene chair with wood fibers, recycled wood fibers. And it, it was something that came out because we started to experiment more and more. And each material presents their own challenges and opportunities. You have different strengths, different molding processes and different issues that come up. Um, but again, incredible learning process that you can then apply to the next material you work with. Um, and I think for us, knowing that we need to constantly work on it and when we work with the designer and they want to iterate on it, it's really important. You, you know, and, and part of, in our process, we're very um, anal about detail. Everything is about the detail in every area. And we, especially when we got into making tooling for these kind of chairs and there's all kinds of new problems we always have to solve on the factory floor as we're doing the injection molding and seam lines and time and pressure and temperature and how to get the surface right. It, it's, it's, it's created new challenges, but again, we employ our same kind of focus on, on the details. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always looking to improve and, and push, push the limit of what we can achieve through aesthetic high quality surfaces on all of our products, balancing the fact that we use waste materials is always, we're always pushing, pushing, pushing and checking. Jay and I go, this is what's in the picture, but we go visit our suppliers. We watch parts coming out of the press. We're really, really uh, fanatic about um, trying to get that balance as best as we can of a really nice product made from, from trash. And yeah. it's yeah. a work in progress all the time. <laughs> And I think a huge part of that work in progress is looking at the material at the end of its life and figuring out how to recycle it. Yeah, um, it, you know, it's, it's not only just figuring out how to recycle it, you know, so one, we care about how do we make it with the longest life possible? How do we make it so people want to keep it? And, and you know, there's a new mindset, it's, it's like, having people understand that all of us are responsible to use waste in, in a good way. And it, I think a good example is that Wabi Sabi chair that, that mm -hmm. came out of the press. We used to take these chairs and throw them away when they were changing from one color to the next. And now, I mean, there's, there's a beauty in this, not only in, it, that has a look of tie dye, but it also, it's using what used to be waste and it's a perfectly good chair. So yeah. I think we have to all do a better job of, of being able to use waste materials in a new way. But this, the 111 chair is interesting because when we first were producing it, we had a lot of rejects and blemishes and problems. And we had to grind up the chairs to try to make a new chair. And in doing that, we worked on this we started working on it in 2006, this material. And fast forward 13 years, we took the same material and then we worked with uh, Ed and Jay, Barbara Oscoby, to create a new chair from a material that now could be endlessly recycled. It's called on and on. Mm -hmm. And I think that exactly the three things that Greg was touching on is all point to this idea 
if we make a chair, it cannot end up in a landfill because it's our value system. You know, like that is devastating to us. Why would we make chairs if they're going to be in the landfill? And there's three ways to keep chairs out of the landfill. One is don't make chairs. You know, so every chair we make, we want to make sure that it deserves a spot on earth. We want to have it be a nice design, something that someone will love their entire lifetime. Second is make them really durable. You're not going to make a chair that ends up in the world and breaks because that's straight to the landfill. And the third is recyclable at the end of life. So that, you know, like on and on, we can continuously recycle it and it, there's a loop for it. There's a place for it to go at the end of the life, um, which was a, an exciting place for us to get with the recycled PET material. So Ed and Jay, when they, they uh, started working with us, they, they took this great material that we, we worked on over, over a long period of time and they came up with a design where they baked the design, the idea of on and on, one, the name on and on, two, it has a circular shape, the seat bottom is circular, and then three, it stacks in a circular way. So it, it was just a real clever way to communicate the idea of a chair that is recyclable yeah. forever. And the next part of that for us was quantifying it. So last September, we actually launched um, uh, working on doing carbon calculations for all of our products and did it for on and on, worked on the 111 Navy, the original Navy chair to just make sure we're capturing what are the number values behind the carbon footprint for this in the carbon footprint just being the best way to measure any given product or object or actions um, environmental impact. So now we're starting to be able to assign numbers and look at, okay, maybe if we adjust the material this way, or if we adjust the packaging this way, we can actually diminish that number on these products and compare it to how other people are doing to give them a point of reference and give ourselves a point of reference of, you know, what impact are we having? Um, I mean, it's all, it's all really exciting and it all comes back to, you know, this, this little place in Hanover, Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, it's all of all of these projects, all these products kind of like come back to that same spirit, um, which started at the factory. So, you know, we'd love to see every, we'd love to see you all come visit for a tour, um, come see all these processes in person. We're open and, uh, and we love visitors and love to kind of show and share this like really unique process and really unique um, prop, like way of making chairs because um, you're not gonna see it many other places. So if you ever are in Hanover, Pennsylvania, come visit us and meet the team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we're open for any questions you have. Great, thank you all so much for that wonderful look inside of Emico. We're gonna switch over to Q&A from the audience. So students definitely send your questions in. First one that we have is, I wanna use this opportunity to learn Emiko's perspective about finishing for our generation, matte or shiny? I'd say long life. You know, it, 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 to us, we're, we just wanna take a material and create something that you can use forever. And, you know, again, like when we did the polished Hudson chair, Paolo Antonelli at the Museum of Modern Art said, this is a beautiful chair. And as it teen is, it's going to get more and more beautiful. Whereas other people, they'll want to take that chair and keep it shiny. So I think it's, that's an individual preference and that material allows you to have it either way. So Jay and Nicole, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think that like, it's not just about the finish and picking aesthetics for us. I think I think we make decisions like like Greg said, materials forward. So what is the most durable finish that can go on that material? Is what's more important than is it glossy or is it flashy or is it matte? So I think you know there's some times where we pick a shiny finish. The polished chairs, those are you can't get more shiny than that. And then I think depending on on really if you center longevity and, and purpose than more than just aesthetic for us when we're choosing finishes. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting too for us. I mean, texture is a huge thing Nicole and I work on that I think before joining Emico, I would not have known how big of a deal it is. You know, like 
everything comes down to what is the sheen and what's the context for that sheen and making sure when you're working on something that it makes sense and it's even and it, you know the biggest thing is actually differences in texture rather than the texture itself um but so we didn't we didn't solve the question for you <laughs> <laughs> no but that's a, a really great point about texture and now that we're not doing screen share your video is a little bit larger maybe you could show us that stool again hmm. and walk through those different details and the texture there so the Zoss stool is interesting because we do it in polished and brushed and brushed is classically our matte, you know, version, but it's still got a sheen to it. And it's so important that the grain, I don't know how, if you can see this, the grain right here is vertical, you know, like you, the vertical grain up to here, and then you have a horizontal grain and then you have a radial grain. So, you know, this is all because of texture and the way the light catches your eye, you know, you can, you can do this this way too and get horizontal all the way across and you get a completely different stool. Um, polished is ubiquitous. It's like one mirror glaze. So you don't, you know, you don't, you don't see the difference in the pieces of the chair as much. And so it, it just completely context. While we're on the subject of uh, show and tell, is that Wabi Sabi chair part of the Emiko collection? And maybe we can just explain what Wabi Sabi is for anyone in the audience who might not be familiar with the term. So Wabi Sabi is, is the, the beauty of the of imperfection and it's a Japanese term. And I, I really, when you see the kind of craftsmanship that comes from Japan, and the acceptance of small flaws because you could tell the human has done it. I, I think there's, there's something to be said about really appreciating things that aren't perfect. And wabi-sabi comes from when you're injection molding, you know, we have per any given collection, six-ish colors. And when you switch over colors, it has to come out of the tool and move to the next color. And it, it ends up looking like this when you're swapping between colors. And it's a beautiful thing, but you also have zero control. You know, you have no ability to decide what it's gonna look like, where the tie dye is. You could get a, a green and red that looks like someone threw up on the chair, or you can get something that looks like an ocean image, you know? And I think for us, it's something where we've kept them. They aren't really for sale, but we are deeply in love with them. I think Nicole and I can attest to it's kind of like that an a little bit. Study. It's like kind of an ongoing little project for us. We really enjoy it and enjoy kind of looking at it because it tells you so much about how the chair was filled and where the plastic flowed. And it's so much of a difference for us, but we're usually so focused on as smooth, seamless, a, you know, uniform surface as you can get. And this is such a departure from that. So we love them. Every chair is a little different. Mm -hmm. It's also you. how Nicole and I end up with our homes full of <laughs> chairs. <laughs> yeah. What is your take on waste from different parts of the world? For example, there's a ton of waste in India. Would you think about country specific furniture? really interesting question because a huge part of carbon footprint is transportation. So, you know, if we're looking at waste material, there's a lot of good waste collection in third world, third world countries where they're able to pick up ocean plastic and beach plastic. Um, and it's something we've looked at, um, you know, all our, all of our supplies, the U S. Um, and we've done that because of carbon footprint and being able to use a localized waste stream, you have more control, you can see it being consolidated. It's, um, and it's just our, our, you know, what we've decided. However, I, I do think it's super interesting and it's amazing to learn how other countries are handling those waste streams. And sometimes they have available waste streams that the U.S. doesn't have. So I wouldn't, I mean, you know, like if you could figure out a way that it would be less carbon intensive to use those waste streams and it would make sense, but it's, um, it gets more complex and more uh, energy intensive when you look at other countries. Interesting. 
What do you say some of the challenges of, of interacting and working with different personalities among designers would be? I think that's a good Greg question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me start off by saying the chemistry has to be good because in the process of doing a project, there are always high and low points. And you better have a great relationship if you're going to get through it. If, if your relationship isn't, isn't good, it's just, it's just too difficult to do a project. And certainly, you know, we, we have had all kinds of different personalities and we have a team that we build around that designer and we support that designer. And we try to be as um, true and focus on what they're trying to achieve as best we can and support them in areas that maybe we have more strength. So um, it's, it's definitely a give and take. And, you know, you have all kinds of different personalities, but we seem to do a pretty good job um, connecting with everyone we, we choose. And again, we don't do very much new projects. We only do like one project a year. We, we try to keep it to that. So we, we do a pretty good job in choosing those people that love us and we love them. I think also not to toot our own horn, but Nicole and I have so much fun. And I think that comes across with the people we work with that they have fun. So, you know, like it doesn't, their personalities could be a full range and we're just doing the thing we love with however they want to work. And I, I don't, you know, it, it's never been an issue. It's always been a really interesting and fun thing to get to know and um, understand someone else's design process. Well, you know, the other thing is it brings out, like for an example, Noto Fukusawa, he's a very understated person and, and he's at the factory and talking about whatever we were talking about. And, and he, in Tokyo, he does, you know, little 5K runs and, we're running out of time. And I said, so well, let's do the 5K in the factory. And, you know, so here we are, we're running through the Emoco factory mm -hmm. because we're running out of time. But, you know, I think it's great when we're working with people who really just enjoy the whole process. And, you know, a guy like Philippe Stark, talk about fun. He's, he's, he's incredible. He's just so much fun to work with. And he's, it, it just, it's great to work with designers that not only bring talent, to you, but also they make the process enjoyable. Mm -hmm. yeah, they want to learn from us too. Like we want to learn from each other. So it's like this kind of fun thing where we're learning how they like to work. They're learning how we like to work. And it's like that space in between that's really fun. And I think with each project, there's like a new to figure out and learn new things and come up with new. So it's, I don't know, it's, there's not like one set way that works. And that's kind of what makes it fun and, and a lot of variety in all the different mm -hmm. projects. Absolutely. How much do you consider ergonomics and body mechanics when designing your chairs? What is that process like? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And I think that's a good example. Zah, you know, I sit on a stool all day and I read a book once about ergonomics where your bones have to connect to a hard place all day. And, and I sit on a hard chair like that. But the whole point is, to have a, something that you're always moving, always moving your body and your muscles aren't contracted and tight, but loose and flexible. So it's a very important part. And to us, just having a surface simple like this. And in this case, uh, Jay, you can point out what, what was important to Noto. So Noto really specified an exact radius. And I don't know if you can see the dip via screen, there's yeah. a dish to the seat and the exact radius is so that your sit bones connect with the seat and you feel sturdy in a round stool and it, it holds you up in a way and it's so subtle. And Nicole and I experimented with so many different radii and how to do it and how to get it exact and the tolerancing right because it makes such a huge difference in how you sit. And you know, it's, it's different than an adjustable chair. It's not like you're not adjusting the the back tilt or whatnot, but you have instead a bunch of small things. If the chair is not comfortable, you're not gonna keep it a long time. Why make it? You know, like the chair has to be something that's ergonomic. And I think that like thinking about motion while you're sitting is something that's also important. I, Cause 
Fukuthawa, what was really important for him was also that, like you pivot as you're having a conversation with somebody and you turn a bit. And so the shape of the seat and your ability to pivot on the seat is like, you know, makes sense with a conversation on like a, a cluster of stools and you're talking to each other. And I think similarly, when we are working on like um, our, our, some of our more office chairs, like our Navy officer series, thinking about this gentle rocking motion that you like to do while you're working. So thinking about not just like sitting in this fixed position, like a task chair with a bunch of knobs and, and levers, but also just the gentle motions you like to do as you're sitting and talking and, and things like that ultimately consider. Mm -hmm. Right. I'd love to hear from each of you and Greg, maybe we could start with you about your individual educational and career journeys that led you to Emico and your current positions. Hmm. I, you know, I, I don't think it was the education for me. I think it was more my experience as far as uh, a love for the environment and where I came from that may, when I was walking through the Emico factory the first time, and I saw this incredible process and this material and these chairs that were just indestructible. To me, I just thought, this is like the most sustainable product possible. That, what, that's what attracted me to really devote, you know, the last 20 some odd years of my life to the, the whole process because I believe in it. Mm -hmm. I think for Nicole and I, it's really interesting because there, we came from both very different backgrounds and have ended up at the same point, but without each other's background, the team dynamic wouldn't work as well because we're coming from different points. You know, like I came, I mean, both of us had grew up on separate sides of the country and um, I grew up with a dad that just wanted to surf all the time <laughs> and then, you, you know, went and did engineering and I worked on mechanical and materials stuff environmentalism and that's my background is like the the numbers the problem sets side but it's it's it doesn't it, you know you could be an engineer or you can come from the design side because nicole can talk a little bit more about her background but it's just it's more of like the approach to problem solving you develop over the course of your education and your life yeah my background is in i um, did furniture design as kind of my undergrad and then worked at a different manufacturers before coming to Emico. But um, I think like Jay said, coming from, you know, coming from different places, I think helps us approach problem solving and materials exploration and things like that in different ways um, that are really helpful so that we can like look at different facets of the same project. Mm -hmm. So for the young designers, you know, like it, it does not matter really where you went to school, what you studied, you know, even maybe where you've worked, but how you approach problems and knowing what your own skill sets are when you approach those and, and your weaknesses. And I think um, one thing Nicole always says is, you know, like getting to see other factories and other processes and how things are made more and more, that's probably the most important part. Yeah, I feel like that is what, that is like what I wish I would have done more of, if anything, as an undergrad, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, just like absorbing more of how things are made, where things come from, how different objects exist, and then where do they go at the end of their life and thinking about decisions and why this is a cheap product, why this is an expensive product, and like thinking like that is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. We have one student that has written in. Thank you, Emiko, for sharing great projects with us and really appreciate how you put effort into making chairs with a sustainable system. I wonder how long does it take to make a chair from experimenting with materials to having a final product? You know, we have had chairs take anywhere. I think in a normal process of going through all the material de development and design iterations, Two years is, is, is a good time frame. We've had chairs take us five years. So it, it sort of depends on how well things just click and work. What's the biggest challenge when creating chairs? Oh. <laughs> you know, 
I think it kind of comes back to the values is every little detail, making sure that it makes sense and it's aligned with the values and going through and not getting tired of going through the little details and saying, do we, do we want this chair in the world? Do we believe in the way it's made? Is this a sustainable thing? And every, every part, you know, like, can we do this better? Can we do this better? Is the hardest and most valuable thing for me, I think. Makes sense. The factory looks pretty labor intensive. How do they handle all the customer requests? Is it possible for any of these manufacturing processes such as polish, polishing to become automatic? We have some automation at the factory, um, but really the chairs are, everyone is so unique and different. Even you'll have a line of 1006 Navy chairs and because they're handmade, everyone is just a little bit different, but it's really hard to automate some of these processes and really retain the quality that we that we want, you know, at making sure every joint is good and every weld is good. Um, and I think the nature of the, our heat treating process and of bending aluminum, like every part is a little different. So we don't really have a lot of automation. And I think it comes back to the focus being on um, handmade high quality um, Uber, turning out lots and lots of chairs. Makes sense. And I think it's really, uh, surprising to people when they come to the factory how analog we are and that we're still making chairs on the same machines that exist in the 1940s you know like yes. it's, this isn't a joke like we're, we're making chairs the same way for 75 years you know like the, the same tools um, there's a guy yeah, that's shocking yeah. The guy that's worked there and he'll always like to say like point out which of the machines is older than him you know, <laughs> presses, the Walt, Walt will be like oh, that one was born before me and, <laughs> but he they like took pride in like passing on the knowledge to the younger guys that work there to maintain and like care for these 1940s and 50s machines that they like really understand how they work and all their idiosyncrasies so it's really cool absolutely I love the idea of reusing materials to create new furnishings. As someone who wants to break into product design, what advice can you give for translating aesthetic, function, and environmental issues into product creation? That's, that's a good question and a tough one. And if you figure it out, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think... Um, it, I think knowing the value is the most important thing, you know, like knowing where you're coming from and using your kind of value compass to make your decisions is going to be, a, is how you make a material um, or make a product. It, I think you just can't stray, you let yourself be constrained by environmentalism and it will really help you make decisions. Great point. Handmade products can be expensive. Is there any strategy for affordable price points to help people choose more sustainable products? I think that's yeah, a great price, price. Price is always a challenge um, because our, our products, like as you saw, they do take a lot of labor. So when we made the Navy chair of aluminum, it's, it's a fairly expensive chair. The flip side is, it's also a chair you only have to buy once and you can keep it for your whole life. And it's not so hard to move or take because it's so lightweight and strong. But to also have a chair that is lower cost, we purposely did the recycled PET the same form as the Navy chair so that we can, we can for those people that want an Emoco chair, here's, here's a way because there's a lot less labor to produce that chair. So we we're able to, to do it in a different material. How can you be patient um, to create long staying design instead of having a new design come out more frequently? Mm -hmm. So I guess what was that, that, that approach of, the approach of you know, focusing on one product a year as opposed to an expansive array of various collections, you know, how do you have patience in that process? You know, I think it takes a whole team 
And when you really have, you know, like Nicole and Jay, they're very focused, you know, starting off with the material and they're, they're doing prototypes and they're working with the guys on the shop floor. They're doing welding and bending. And, and when you have that many people that are all in, in engaged in one product, the product turns out really good and it takes a lot of time. So for us, we'd rather work on one thing and do it really well than a bunch of things and do them not so great. I think it kind of comes back to what Jay was saying also about like the three ways that we can approach like a, a, a sustainable sustainability and product design. And one of them is less chairs, even though we make chairs, you know, it's like not needing to just churn out new things constantly and being thoughtful and purposeful in what we do work on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We are just about out of time, unfortunately, but I have one last question and I'd love to hear from each of you. Nicole, maybe we can start with you on this one. Any last words of advice or wisdom that you have for the students tuning in today? I think learning about how things are made. And, you know, I've broken a broken record about it sometimes, but I really think that that ties into understanding where things come from and understanding like the impact things have in processes. I think touring facilities, touring factories, watching videos on YouTube about how things are made. Jay and I love to just go down YouTube dives of, of looking at manufacturing. So familiar, familiarizing yourself with processes and production I think is a good, good thing to do as much as you can. Mm-hmm. Jay, maybe we could hear from you next. You know, I think one thing that constantly comes up in product development is every day there's a problem. You know, every day there's a a screw that you can't get anymore. There's a material that's not working right. And I think the mindset and, you know, not taking yourself so seriously, not taking, you know, we are so proud of what we do. Our work is our life. And yet we're just making chairs. You know, I think getting down to the mindset of what you're really doing gets you to approach these issues that are gonna constantly come up in manufacturing and design with a little bit more levity that will help you not get so burnt out on the length of your career. And I'm, I'm saying this and it's hypocritical because I still, I still definitely fall into that trap. <laughs> and I would say, again, the same thing we said at the start is be, be true to your purpose. And if you are following your values, your purpose, decisions are easy. And, and I think, you know, have fun in the process. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. All, right. All great advice. Greg, Jay, Nicole, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing this inside look into Emico. We really appreciate it. Students, thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to learn more about Emico or Be Original Americas, you can visit the links in the chat. Thank you again, and we will see you on the next one. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.